At the beginning of 1967, the batteries were spread out. Alpha was at Lycay when they moved from Bearcat on December 27, 1966. On January 6, 1967, the battery exchanged two of its 8-inch howitzers with crews for two 175mm guns with crews from Bravo Battery, 2nd Battalion, 32nd Artillery. This was directed by two field force in order to better support Operation Cedar Falls, which took place 8 January 67 to 17 January 67. Both the 8-inch and 175 gun sections of Alpha Battery fired extensively in support of this operation, performing in a general support reinforcing role for the 1st and 25th Infantry Divisions. Operation Cedar Falls begins during the Vietnam War. Six brigade-sized U.S. Army units conducted a large-scale search-and-destroy operation into the communist stronghold called the Iron Triangle, northwest of Saigon. The target area included training, supply, and staging areas for a Viet Cong division, regional military, political command, and control units. When the operation ended on January 26, U.S. forces uncovered about a half million documents with intelligence on enemy forces, captured 1,000 enemy fighters, and large quantities of weapons. They also destroyed a regional headquarters complex of over a thousand bunkers, tunnels, and surface structures. The success provided a temporary advantage to U.S. forces. Charlie Battery continued to go on turkey shoots throughout the winter and spring of 1967 displacing a total of six times to various locations around Phuc Vinh. On two occasions, they displaced to the village of An Lin, popular forces outpost, to support special forces operations, firing preparatory fires against a VC base camp. Headquarters battery was also at Phuc Vinh. In January 1967, ground was broken for the battalion's biggest civil affairs project to date the construction of a small hospital for the villagers of Nuk Vang. It was a cooperative project between the men of the battalion and the villagers. Assistance was given by the Fu Gao District Chief, Major Lu Yem, and by the MACV advisor for this area, Major James Hall. The project was placed under the overall control of the battalion surgeon with the headquarters battery commander in charge of the actual construction. This hamlet, like most in Vietnam, had been troubled for many years by the lack of medical care for its citizens. Though the dispensary at Phuc Vinh was only four miles away, the villagers could make the trip to it only with the utmost difficulty. Thus the idea of the hospital was conceived to alleviate this situation. Largely through the efforts of the 6th Battalion 27th Artillery, the residents of this village were able to live with a considerably higher degree of security. Moreover, the hospital stood ready to give modern medical treatment to those that were sick. The hospital was a symbol of the friendship of the Americans of the 6th Battalion 27th Artillery with the Vietnamese of Nuc Vang, a symbol that would endure long after the smoke of the battalion's guns had blown away. Although the villagers cooperated willingly with the Americans at first, the VC stepped up their campaign of intimidation in Nuc Vang, hoping to undo with coercion what the Americans would do with friendship and cooperation. The 1st Battalion, 26th Infantry, conducted a search and seal operation in the Nuc Vang area to provide temporary security. A permanent solution did not occur, however, until a popular forces outpost was constructed near the village. This project was initiated by the 6th to the 27th. The schoolhouse adjacent to the hospital was painted at the same time by the men of the headquarters battery. The hospital was dedicated in a ribbon-cutting ceremony on May 24, 1967. This was the same day that the battalion fired its 125th round in Vietnam and its 100th round in all three corps tactical zone. A 175mm gun was brought to Nuc Vang for this commemorative firing. Bravo Battery remained up north near the DMZ at Camp Carroll. If you will permit me, I would like to spend a little more time with Bravo Battery. They were real heroes. If you recall, Bravo now designated Delta Battery as they joined the 2nd of the 94th Artillery was at Camp Carroll. After dealing with the rain and mud caused by the monsoon rains in October and November, 
the battery could do little building because of the constant rain. Eventually, the 2nd of the 94th supplied hardbacks, wooden tent frames and floors, which got the men out of the mud. In addition, they suffered from inadequate resupply until army units moved up to the DMZ. And unfortunately, ordnance support was negligible, even though a team from the 185th Maintenance Battalion accompanied the battery on its trip to the I Corps area. As a result of the severe mental pressure of living under the constant threat of mortar attacks, and because of the primitive living conditions, morale of the men of Battery B began to slip a bit. Several men approached nervous breakdowns, and one man was sent to a psychiatrist for consultation in order to give the men as much respite as was possible from their hard lives. The r, &R program was emphasized. Field showers and additional fortifications were constructed. Religious services were held, and a good program of keeping the men informed of the situation around them was instituted. Shortly thereafter, Battery B became involved in some spectacular action. On May 2, 1967, the North Vietnamese hit Gio Lin with 1,000 rounds of artillery fire from 11 different locations in North Vietnam and in the DMZ. The communists fired 105 mm artillery and 82 mm mortar rounds onto the hilltop base, aiming specifically at the 175 long toms used to fire across the DMZ into North Vietnam. Two Marines were killed and 73 wounded during the attack. A second attack, just after midnight, poured 50 82 mm mortar rounds onto Gio Lin, wounding four Marines. At the same time, the Marine base at Don Ha was hit by 50 rounds of Russian-made 140 mm rockets and 82 mm mortars. 11 Americans were killed and 67 wounded at Don Ha. Marines swept into the communist positions after the attacks and found 50 rockets and 30 rocket sites. A third attack that same evening hit the Fubai airfield with 100 rounds of 82 mm mortars. A week later, the battery was involved in the pitched battle for the Special Forces camp at Kantien, two miles south of the DMZ. While two reinforced North Vietnamese battalions attacked Kantien, mortar and rocket attacks were launched simultaneously against three nearby artillery bases in an attempt to disrupt artillery support of that camp. Battery B received 150 mortar rounds that inflicted light damage to the U.S. artillery. Camp Carroll was hit by 20 Chinese 100mm rockets and Dong Ha was hit by 30 Russian-made 240mm rockets. Highway 1 from Dong Ha to Jiu Lin was cut off at the same time. The attack at Kan Tien was repulsed after a three-hour battle, during which the North Vietnamese broke through part of the perimeter defense, destroying a number of bunkers by throwing satchel charges into them. As the enemy withdrew, heavy artillery fire from Dong Ha and Jiu Lin blasted their escape routes along with airstrikes. Information received from 10 captured NVA soldiers indicated that the artillery scored direct hits on the communists. Friendly casualties at Kantien included 35 persons killed and 109 wounded, while the enemy suffered 179 killed. Over 100 enemy weapons were captured. In 1967, Mike Wallace with CBS News did a broadcast on Kantien called The Ordeal of Kantien. I've included an excerpt from that broadcast so you can experience a little of what those Marines experienced at Kantien and also get a taste of what Bravo Battery experienced at Gio Lin and Camp Carroll. Because of the following CBS News special report, the program normally seen at this time will not be presented today. Oh, 
Yeah, right. Where is it? They, uh, we can't reach those big guns and they just keep dropping in. There's nothing you can do. It's sort of like being a big bullseye on top of a hill. And uh, you're just sitting there waiting. You can't be safe, you can be lucky. That's it. You can't be safe, you can be lucky. That's it. Stuff landing all over, bouncing off you. And uh, get just as scared every time. And it gets worse. The closer they get, the more they throw. The more you get scared. Then you get up. It's a wonderful feeling just to be alive, to be able to walk around after one of those. An obscure American outpost in Vietnam, as Tarawa, Iwo Jima, and Guadalcanal were once obscure. Contien is a bitterly exposed target just two miles below the DMZ. American Marines have been under fire there since last May. In just the last four weeks, they have suffered over 70 dead, 1,000 wounded. In the next half hour, we shall examine the ordeal of Khan Tien. This is a CBS News special report. The ordeal of Khan Tien. This broadcast is brought to you by West... Here is CBS News correspondent Mike Wallace. Khan Tien is here, two miles south of the demilitarized zone at the narrow top of South Vietnam, 12 miles inland from the South China Sea. It is a desolate hilltop collection of guns and bunkers looking north across the DMZ into North Vietnam. Its crucial importance lies in the fact that it's on a main infiltration route into the south. The loss of Con Tien could help open the way for the estimated 35,000 communist troops now massed in the DMZ area. Its loss would block the construction of that electronic barrier along the DMZ to seal off South Vietnam from the north. But more than that, its loss would give the North Vietnamese that one big elusive propaganda victory they've been searching for at such a cost in lives. They would prize a victory at Con Tien as a miniature replica of their victory over the French at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. Con Tien is vulnerable. It is the least defensible of any of the American outposts because it's so close to North Vietnamese territory. The enemy artillery, about a hundred big guns plus mortars and rockets, can pound Con Tien around the clock with devastating effect. And our ground troops cannot go into North Vietnam to knock out those guns. For the Marines at Con Tien, this is what it's like. What happened to your squad? Oh, uh, they was hit. Most of them was hit by shrapnel, mm -hmm. and there was medipack. Well, tell me, uh, you came here at full strength? Oh, I had 13 men when I came. And it's four days later now, and how many are still here? Six. I think we're just uh, occupying ground and uh, losing too many men. I'm losing too many men. If we were to stay here too much longer, we we wouldn't have much left of this platoon, let alone the company. Uh, I see. What about three, four people get it a day? Uh, not, not real bad, but enough to be medevac. Cut my platoon down. Well, isn't that all part of war, as the generals say? Sure it is, but for seven months up here, one battalion ain't gonna have much left if, if that's part of war. That'll rotate a little more, I think. Send us back where we can get new men and train them. See, we're getting new men out here. They coming out, well, what you might call green, and then they, they don't know really how to act. The rifles have been jamming, the, the mud's been, uh, has slowed everything down, and the artillery comes in everywhere. And uh, 
just gets pretty futile and frustrating sometimes. But the really depressing part about it is, uh, like, there isn't really much you can do, you know what I mean? You see the rounds come in, you see your buddies get blown away and wounded and stuff like that. Well, I can't say that I'm scared stiff, but I'm scared. I mean, after a while, you know it's going to come. And you can't do nothing about it. And you just look to God. It's about the only thing you can do. Well, do you get any idea from up around Kanchen how the war is going? Yes. If we, uh, if we don't get some more people up in this area real quick, and we don't get some more B-52s real fast, then these people are going to be all the way down to Da Nang before anybody knows it. Does everybody agree with that? 100%. What kind of support are the Marines getting? General Westmoreland says the Americans are responding with the greatest concentration of conventional firepower in history. The U.S. artillery fire is ten times greater than the enemy's. It comes from Dong Ha, Cam Lo, Jo Lin, the other outpost corners of what is called Leatherneck Square, and from these big guns at Camp Carroll. The batteries fire off as many as 10,000 shells daily, lobbing them over the heads of the men at Contien deep into the demilitarized zone. Battery B received two more attacks shortly thereafter. On May 10, 1967, 20 Americans were wounded in a series of mortar, artillery, and rocket attacks on Gio Lin and Contien. Hardest hit was Gio Lin, where 66 artillery rounds and 30 82 millimeter mortar rounds landed inside the camp at 1020 hours. The next night, a similar attack pelted Gio Lin with 85 millimeter, 100 millimeter, and 122 millimeter artillery fires, some from the guns with ranges up to 12 miles. Some of these weapons were fired by the enemy for the first time in the war. This truly was a dangerous place to be in South Vietnam. 10 Americans were wounded during the attacks. Battery B's two months at Gio Lin had resulted in their firing of an amazing number of rounds. From March 23rd to May 18th, the battery fired 13,056 rounds, many of which were into North Vietnam. They certainly had earned their meritorious unit commendation. On September 15, 1967, Bravo Battery returned to Benoit, a battle-worn but high-spirited fighting force. On this same date, they were designated to go to Phuc Binh to support Special Forces units in the surrounding area. However, due to their worn condition, they could not feasibly meet the assigned date to be there. Instead, for the first time in history of the Vietnam campaign, a heavy artillery unit was airlifted from Ben Hoa to Phuc Binh in place of Bravo Battery. B Battery 7th Battalion 8th Artillery took the commitment. It took an amazing 27 C-130 sorties and was accomplished in a staggering time of 12 hours. In about one month on October 19, 1967, the personnel of Bravo Battery, 7th of the 8th Artillery, were released from this attachment and changed places with the personnel of Bravo Battery, 6th of the 27th. On that same date, Bravo Battery, 6th of the 27th Artillery, assumed control of the Phuc Binh Fire Support Base. Bravo Battery, 6th of the 27th, marked many firsts in Vietnam history and that they were the first 175mm 8-inch howitzer artillery unit to fire into North Vietnam and destroy surface-to-air missile bases. They were the first Army artillery unit to fire in support of Marine operations and attack, and they were the first heavy artillery unit to fire direct fire while under attack.
during Bravo Battery's detachment from the 6th to the 27th Artillery, they were acting as a semi-independent unit, making moves from Camp J.J. Carroll to Da Nang to Wei to Gio Lin and return. While making these moves, they were engaged in the following campaigns, High Rise, Kingfisher, Cumberland, Crockett, and Cimarron. Two months later, on December 19, 1967, the fire support base occupied by Bravo Battery, 6th to the 27th Artillery at Phuc Binh, was designated as Camp Martin in honor of Private First Class Leonard J. Martin, who was killed by hostile artillery fire at Gio Lin on April 30, 1967. On a lighter note, in January 1967, the battalion commander read in a magazine about a new sophisticated target acquisition device known as the Manpack Personal Detector Chemical. This device was able to locate personnel by detection of their body odors, nicknamed the Sniffer. It reacted to the ammonia emitted by humans and to smoke. The man-packed personnel detector is designed to alert troops to the presence of concealed humans in ambush. By detecting increases in the concentration of condensation nuclei in the atmosphere caused by man's effluence. Signal readout is by both visual and audio means. Detection range is at least 250 meters downwind, depending on wind direction and velocity, local terrain, and environment. A short time later, Lieutenant Colonel O'Connor and Captain Jack Jones, then the battalion's aviation officer, secured two of these machines from the ACTVIV in Saigon to test their effectiveness in the battalion aerial reconnaissance program. As the personnel detector was at the time still in the experimental stages, the battalion had no previous experience from which to draw. The detector was mounted behind the back seat in an L-19 aircraft, with the detector probe being mounted on the wing strut. The air observer then monitored the dial as the pilot flew at low level over suspected enemy locations. When the dial indicated the presence of personnel below, the pilot then flew back and forth over the hot area to determine the exact enemy location. Readings were generally downwind from the actual enemy location. Results of use of the sniffer were generally encouraging. Several base camps were discovered by the sniffer. It was used to support several operations conducted by the Special Forces and the 1st Brigade 1st Infantry Division. The man pack personnel detector proved useful enough to be utilized by many other units, including the 1st and 9th Infantry Division. The battalion's experiences with the detector undoubtedly aided other units in their own use of the machine. On February 3, 1967, Alpha Battery moved from Lai Kei to Quan Loi without incident. Quan Loi, located just 10 miles from the Cambodian border, was in the middle of the huge Terra Rouge or Red Earth rubber plantation near Anlok, the provincial capital of Binh Long province. Quan Loi, located in a central location of the other rubber plantations, was a place for French Terra Rouge plantation managers to meet and relax. It had an Olympic-sized swimming pool, tennis courts, an airstrip doubling as a golf course. It also had a modern clubhouse for plantation managers to socialize. Naturally, there were no accommodations for an 8-inch, 175mm self-propelled artillery unit when Alpha Battery arrived there. So the men, along with local help, set to work constructing a firing battery area south of the clubhouse grounds. They first built wood floor personnel tents, a mess hall, and an underground fire direction control center for the battery's four guns. A short time later, they built an orderly room and an EM club and an NCO officers club. It would be the battery's home until mid-1970. The battalion experienced its third and fourth casualties on the same day, June 17, 1967, at Quan Loi. Staff Sergeant Samuel Lee Modisette, 
age 26, and Corporal Charles Michael Roach, age 20, both posthumously promoted, were killed when a round in their gun exploded in the muzzle. Both were killed by fragmentations from the shell and the muzzle blast. Five others were injured in the accident. All were members of Alpha Battery at Guan Hoi. Staff Sergeant Modisett from Vanilla, Arkansas, was survived by his wife, a son, Samuel Jr., age five, and his parents. Samuel is buried at Leechville Cemetery in Leechville, Arkansas. of Midlothian, Illinois, was survived by his parents and three sisters. He was an only son and had been in Vietnam for only six weeks. He is buried at Skyline Memorial Park in Monty, Illinois. So you are aware Kwan Loi could be a dangerous place to be stationed. Short of a month later, on July 14, 1967, Private Michael Stanley Barrick, a mechanic serving with Alpha Battery, was killed in the early morning of July 14, when Kwan Loi received several enemy mortar rounds. The first rounds hit outside of the hooch, where Alpha Battery members were sleeping. The next round came through the roof and reportedly injured every person inside with metal fragments. Most were able to scramble out to a nearby bunker. However, Private Barrick suffered fatal wounds in the attack. He was age 21, and he is buried at Resurrection Catholic Cemetery and Mausoleums in Justice, Illinois. So the story goes. Shortly after this mortar attack, a general came to Quan Loy to investigate why the high count of injured in Private Barrick's death from mortar rounds. He concluded that the tent hooches were no place to sleep, and soon the battery started building underground personnel bunkers to replace the hooches. I can attest from my personal experiences in 1969 at Quan Loi, an underground personnel bunker was a much safer place to sleep than tent hooches when incoming mortar rounds were fired into the battery area. On July 11, 1967, just three days before Private Barrick's death, there was a well-coordinated attack against Guan Loi Base Camp and Alpha Battery 6 of the 27th Artillery by the 141st NVA Regiment, made up of 1,060 men. During the early morning hours, several NVA elements entered the camp through the perimeter wire. Number 3 gun was destroyed by satchel charges, and there were six wounded within the battery while well, there were seven killed from hostile fire at Quan Wai and a total of 27 wounded. There were seven NVA dead by actual body count and an estimated 10 more when the attack was finally brought under control. Fortunately, there were no battery personnel dead. During the attack, approximately 200 rounds of mortar fire fell on Quan Wai. Once the base was hit with mortars, the VC ground raid commenced. It is believed that the VC infiltrated at an earlier time and stayed in the French club swimming pool area overnight. When the mortar attack began, they commenced their attack. Also, the VC, seen on top of the administration building, may have infiltrated in around the same time as the group in the French club area. During the period Bravo Battery conducted its moves around the DMZ, all other batteries remain stationary, except for displacements to conduct artillery assaults. Notable among these were Rapid Fire 2, November 6 to 10, Rapid Fire 4, 14 to 27 November, 
Operation Yellowstone, 1, 8 to 25 December, and St. Nick, 18 to 25 December, 1967.